So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. As I say every week, I'm so honored that you're here, that you tune into this show. It means a lot to me because you're busy people. I say that all the time, but you are. And uh, if you like what you hear, and most people do, I, I run into people all the time who say, I listen to your show, and they tell me what show it was. And they like what they hear. Today's going to be a great conversation because I have a, a, a friend of mine on the show. His name is Eugene Kim. He's, he's a doctor. He is a pediatric surgeon. He comes with a lot of credentials. He's the vice chair of, de, uh, of the Department of Surgery at Cedar sinai and uh, also the chief of the Division of Pediatric Sur Surgery at Cedar sinai uh, Dr. Eugene Kim, it's such a pleasure to have you today on the Hamilton Review. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, excited to be here. Thank you. So, Dr. Kim, usually what we do uh, when you listen to my show, which I know that you're probably too busy to listen to, <laughs> no no apologies, Dr. Yeah. Kim, I understand. This guy's a busy guy, friends. Um, so, Dr. Kim, what I'd like to do is I, I turn the microphone over to you and I say, and I ask you, tell us about yourself, tell us about your journey in life. Um I know that when you were born uh, a young boy, uh, people didn't call you Dr. Kim. You were just probably Eugene, right? And so there's a, you've kind of come a long way. You're a young guy. But tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so um, uh, my parents uh, um, immigrated from South Korea uh, in the late 60s. And uh, my father uh, followed uh, his older brother, uh, and they settled in Augusta, Georgia, of all places. And uh, as a little kid, I didn't uh, uh, appreciate the significance of Augusta, Georgia, and the uh, and the location of the Masters. But um, <laughs> but uh, it was just a small town that that we grew up in. And my father didn't have. Um, a useful educational degree. He had a degree in political science from a Korean university, and there's not a lot you can do with that. And so he put himself through school, uh, which was particularly challenging because they didn't speak much English at all. And of all places to immigrate to, Augusta, Georgia was not a haven for Korean immigrants or Asians. And so uh, that really forced my parents to learn English more quickly. And I think in turn, that allowed us to uh, assimilate uh, to the culture more quickly as as children. And um, he put himself through school and got a chemistry degree and started working in laboratories. And over my childhood, we moved quite a few times as he moved to different uh, chemical laboratories. And um, that was my upbringing in the Deep South, uh, Georgia, uh, Arkansas, and then where I grew up most of my years in East Texas, in Tyler, Texas. And so um, clearly, I think um, my upbringing in the South uh, 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 and and the Bible Belt and that whole area uh, had a huge part uh, to do with my upbringing. And uh, um, I, I had a great time uh, growing up there with uh, my younger brother. Amazing. So you um, so you, you were your parents, your, your first generation. Were you born in Korea or were you born in, in the U.S.? Oh, I was born in Augusta, Georgia. Yeah. Okay. So you're a, you're a first generation. So mm -hmm. you were moving around and um, how, uh, your, your childhood, I mean, did you, did, were you a happy kid? Were you, uh, what, what kind of a, a, of a childhood did you have? Yeah, I think it was um, uh, pretty happy. My parents are pretty happy people in general. My, one of the ways that my father, um, uh, supported the family was he taught martial arts. And so he's a uh, pretty accomplished and, and recognized, uh, martial arts instructor, um, uh, both in Taekwondo, he's, uh, an eighth degree black belt and was involved with training some of the Olympic athletes in the U S and he, uh, was a sixth degree, uh, black belt in judo where he, uh, participated with, uh, the Korean national team back in his day. So, uh, very accomplished, and that kind of became the family business, as it were. And so I grew up uh, doing martial arts, and uh, everywhere we went, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, something that uh, I always did and participated in. And as I got older and became a teenager, you know, uh, my brother and I would 
uh, go and teach some of the classes. Uh, my father had set up a number of classes, not only in the city that we lived in, Tyler, but also the surrounding cities in East Texas. And so we were literally doing martial arts five days a week. And that was kind of the family business. So uh, probably that specifically had a lot to do with uh, not only my upbringing, but uh, how I think and how I approach challenging situations, just that kind of uh, mindset of discipline. And yeah, uh, and, yeah no, and, I mean, that, that kind of discipline, you, you, you can take that on the road with you and yeah. use it in many, many different arenas. So are you, you're a black belt, I, I presume. Yeah, yeah. I, I got up to the level of second degree black belt. And, you know, I had uh, had the opportunity to train at the uh, uh, Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, where we got to um, really meet and work out with a lot of the junior Olympic people. But that was oh, a long time ago. And I knew I had to kind of make a decision of whether you're going to do that or whether you're going to go to school and focus on that. And at the yeah. time, this was sometime around college, I decided I wanted to be a doctor and I better get on with it. Yeah. So, you know, listen, Eugenia, I had no idea that you were a second level <laughs> black belt. I, I'll next time I, I run into you, I'll treat you with more respect. <laughs> okay. No, we, because... we try to figure out ways to stay out of trouble, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I, I, I don't want you to have to operate on me after you turn me apart. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, so you made that, you, you made a decision that you wanted to graduate from the, um, the martial arts uh, world into a different uh, world, namely the world of medicine. Now, certainly your father was a chem in the chemist. He was a chemist. So you had a little bit of a, a science bend uh, somewhere in that family. So tell us about that transition. Um, I think, you know, going to, um, uh, I, I went to a small, you know, public uh, high school uh, and uh, middle school in, in East Texas and, and they were good schools and I was happy, but you don't know what you don't know. Uh, but the real transition, I think a real major point in my life is when uh, my, my mom had me apply to these prestigious boarding schools in the Northeast. And I, I, I didn't know what they were. I had no idea. Um, all I knew was that a friend's kid in even a smaller East Texas town went to one of these schools. And so she just kind of surreptitiously had me take these standardized test exams. Uh, we went and visited the schools. You know, remarkably, I got in. And uh, and when I was 15, uh, which was the 10th grade year, um, I went up to a boarding school in Andover, Massachusetts. And uh, it was a huge, huge change in how I think and how I studied and I think it really was the foundation for me being able to really understand and study at a very high level. Yeah. Which, which school did you go to? Uh, it's called Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. Okay. So Phillips Academy is, of course, famous. And uh, you guys put out a lot of uh, stellar alumni, don't you? They're all over the place. Uh, yeah. I, I got a kick out of it when I was younger. But, um, you know, one of the things that I've come to learn over the years is you know, you learn things in school, um, but I think you learn the most from the people that you're around and the students that you're around. Yeah. And I, 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 it's your colleagues that bring you to a higher level than what you read in a book. What you read in a book is important, but the people who really challenge you and push how you think, I think, are your classmates, your dorm mates. And I, I can't say enough about those people who were around me during those school years. And so particularly boarding school, um, it really, um, it was very hard because again, going from a public high school in uh, Tyler, Texas to this boarding school, it, it's a, it was a huge step up in, in rigor and, uh, and intensity. But once I got used to that, um, I felt like anything was possible after that. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and you were putting to, you were putting also use of your martial arts discipline. You had you had to really pull out all the stops there. I, I'm sure more the mental aspect and less the physical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you was that the time that during your high school years? Was that the time you began to think about medicine? Um, it's kind of uh, funny. As long as I can remember, since I was a little kid, uh, I always felt a draw towards medicine and helping people. Um, I don't know if it was the typical 
Korean parent thing going, you're going to be a doctor when you grow up. And so it just kind of got instilled in me. But um, it it always was planted in my head long before I went to uh, high school or 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 college even. Um, I can recall really wanting to be a doctor since I was really a young kid. And I remember really developing an interest in surgery uh, uh, as I was entering middle school. So uh, going to middle school, they used to turn off the lights in the class, science class, and play those rickety films. And one of those science films was of a dog with his with the chest open and the beating heart. And yeah. while half the class was like squealing, I just thought it was the most amazing thing the, uh, just to see what was inside. And um, that got my interest up. And I thought I wanted to be a heart surgeon at that point for many, many years. And uh, also, you know, my my days of playing on the on the roads of uh, East Texas and all the uh, unfortunate animals you would find on the road. And that was a lot of my um, uh, uh, thinking that I would be some kind of surgeon when I grew up. Amazing. Uh, yeah, those rickety old films, they they did plant some uh, some thoughts in your mind, didn't they? Yeah. The, the first time I ever saw a beating heart was actually in, in the chest of a human being. I'll yeah. never forget when I was in medical school, I went to and saw a thoracic surgery. And, the, and first of all, when they took the, the saw and cracked the chest, I thought that was like really rude. And you know, they yeah. just cut the guy right open. I go, whoa. And then they open the heart and then there's this dynamic beating heart is in front of you and you kind of go, Wow, we're yeah. we're a living human. You know, we're living people. It's very. Right. Uh, let me tell you, friends, it's a very dynamic uh, visual. Uh, I can tell you that. So you were thinking about medicine. You were thinking about maybe surgery. Where did mm -hmm. you go to college? Um, I graduated from Harvard. So very fortunate again to to be able to uh, um, learn from those professors. And and like I said, I learned a lot from the other students and my dorm mates uh, a lot. Uh, uh, Think different ways of thinking and uh, uh, and pushing you higher than where you would have been on your own. Absolutely. And then you went to you then applied to medical school. You majored in what at Harvard? Uh, biochemical sciences. So it was the uh, it was um, uh, they didn't really have a molecular biology at the time. I, I, it, it was an emerging field, but for all intents and purposes, I was a molecular biology major. I, I did my um, senior thesis and research at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And so just su such a wonderful opportunity to begin what would end up a lifelong interest and study in um, in cancer. Yep. And and so um, um, that's where it all started and uh, uh, um, had a great experience with that. And you went from Harvard to medical school where? Yep, at Columbia in New York City. Sure. Um, uh, after finishing, I I had been in Boston at that point for about seven years with college and um, and boarding school, and I I wanted to to see the next big thing, and to me, nothing was bigger than New York City, and so I was so pleased to have the opportunity to uh, to go train there. New York City is pretty impressive, especially <laughs> when you're a young kid from yeah. Tyler, Texas. <laughs> you it go really there. changed. But oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. So you went to you went to Columbia and uh, you got your degree, and then you went on from there for your surgical training. Right. So I um I finished four years there, and then I had the good fortune of staying at Columbia for the next seven years to do my surgical training, and so um, that's eleven years in Manhattan. Saw a lot in that time period, and um um including, you know, when 9-11 happened, that was really an amazing uh, thing to witness and be a part of at that time in uh, U.S. history. But um, the four years of medical school was followed by um, seven years of training in general surgery. Uh, two of those years was really dedicated to doing research. Um, somewhere along that time, I, I thought maybe uh, this heart surgery thing wasn't quite what I wanted. And so I had some amazing mentors at Columbia in pediatric surgery, which eventually showed me the light, as it were. And so I um, uh, headed in that direction. Uh, but one doesn't just choose to go into pediatric surgery and sign a form. You actually have to do, you have to put together some significant credentials for a program to choose you. And so I spent two years in the research lab at uh, Columbia, 
and uh, worked with two fantastic people. Again, this was pediatric cancer that I was studying for two years, a uh, specific cancer that I continue to study to this day. It's called neuroblastoma. It's a very aggressive uh, solid tumor cancer of children. And uh, that really kind of piqued my interest, but it also put me in a great position to be able to uh, uh, qualify for one of these pediatric surgery positions. Yeah. How many of them are there in the country? Well, when I applied, so this was the late 90s, um, there were probably about 20 some programs. Yeah. Um, slowly over the years, there's about 50 now, about 50 now. And how many, uh, because pediatric surgeons are rare people, how many pediatric surgeons are there in the country, in the entire country? Gosh, there's probably about four to 500. Um, but interestingly, I think we're Hold getting on. to there a point. Four, four to 500 in the entire yeah. country. Yeah. So you all know each other. They all, we, we all know each other. It's amazing. I mean, this is a big country. This is a so country if, of 300 million someone, people. Yeah. If someone needed a pediatric surgeon in Boston, I... I know almost the entire group, and I'd be like, oh, you need to go see this person or this person. And that's true for pretty much every major city. Uh, I don't necessarily know all the private practice ones, and there's a good number of those, but um, I certainly know all of the academic ones. It's amazing. It's a very, very uh, elite group of people uh, when you think <laughs> about that. It really is. Um, so you you're, you made it into, into pediatric surgery. Um and I, I, I want to. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm watching our time here, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a, a one minute break here and come back. But I, I want to talk a little bit about some of your experiences in pediatric surgery, and also I'd like to talk to you about what you're doing now because you've had a major, uh, big step in your career, which is very exciting, and I want people to talk uh, to hear about it. So, friends, you're listening today to the Hamilton Review. We're having a conversation with Dr. Eugene Kim. He is the chief. Uh, the Division of Pediatric Surgery at Cedar sinai Hospital here in Los Angeles. We will be right back. The Hamilton Review Podcast is brought to you by Hamilton Babies, nine kid-friendly products designed for the little loves in your life. Find them at hamiltonbabies.com or amazon.com. Also consider Dr. Hamilton's recently published book, Seven Secrets of the Newborn, available at Barnes & Noble, your local independent bookstore, and amazon.com. So, friends, welcome back to the Hamilton Review. We're continuing our conversation today with Dr. Eugene Kim, pediatric surgeon over at Cedars Sinai. Uh, Dr. Kim, you mentioned when you were a kid that you had this idea of helping people, even when helping people in the medical world. At that point, I don't know if you really had focused on surgery or what you were thinking about, but you've now been out there. You've been doing pediatric surgery for a while here in Los Angeles. Um, tell us like, just a, a case or two of, of kids that you've been able to really intervene and really make a difference in their lives. Yeah, I mean, there it's it's such a, a gratifying uh, field and world. That's that's for sure. And one of the themes that um, that pediatric surgeons um, and I think all pediatric providers is that you know you're not only just um, necessarily uh, saving a life, but you're you're also saving a lifetime. You know that little interventions in infancy and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, we, I think, I personally think when when you go into pediatric surgery, the crown jewel of pediatric surgery, what sets sets us all apart and really created this field of pediatric surgery, um, is uh, infant surgery or congenital anomalies, children who were born with anomalies that would not have survived um, 50 years ago, uh, but now completely live uh, normal lives. Uh, and it's especially gratifying when it's, you know, just something surgical that we can do uh, that that fixes things. And um, I remember I spent a number of years at Texas Children's Hospital, uh, a very busy hospital. I uh, love being in Houston. I think part of it was to get back to my roots a little bit before coming to Los Angeles. And I took care of one baby, and she had multiple anomalies that she was born with. So she was born with an esophagus that wasn't connected, uh, so you couldn't swallow it, ended in a blind pouch. And the other part of the esophagus was connected to her trachea, so that is a challenge, that's a problem. And so, uh, but also known with that is you can have multiple other anomalies. And uh, she ended up having a club foot on one side. She also had uh, what we call an imperforate anus. That's when your anus doesn't, 
develop in its normal place and we have to surgically uh, create a new anus uh, uh, for the baby. And so um, that was a, a really gratifying case. And, you know, not always, a lot of families, you know, go on, they live great lives, but they don't necessarily stay in touch with their doctors. But this one always did and um, always stayed in touch, always sent a Christmas card. And it's so beautiful to see how this young woman has grown up. And uh, she, um, you know, from a, a, a swallowing standpoint, did perfectly after re we reconnected and fixed all of that. All the stuff down below works just fine. She grew up great. She ended up needing to have a amputation of her leg, even as a small child. But to see her strength and how she's literally become the face of young children with disabilities and how they overcome. And so she runs track. She has uh, got sponsorship deals with the prosthetic companies. And wow. she travels all over the country just showing her strength. And I'm so proud of her, her mom, and now her, you know, uh, communicate and say, you know, and, and they, for some reason, come to Los Angeles with some frequency. So I always try to uh, take the opportunity to go visit and take a picture. And so that was a really special patient, still co uh, continue to communicate with them to the day. But unfortunately, in our field, a lot of times, you know, the patients, you know, you you fix their hernia, you take out their appendix, they're fine, <laughs> and they go on with life. But uh, certain cases like that are, are certainly memorable and gratifying and really represent why we do what we do. It's amazing. I mean, and you really do, you guys, I, I can't tell people how valuable pediatric surgeons are when when we are as pediatricians we would we may see a kid like that who has basically a, what we call a tracheoesophageal fistula or uh these these anomalies uh, between their esophagus and trachea and uh well or an anal imperfect imperfect anus uh which we had the other day we had a patient who had that and um, I mean, we're we as general pediatricians are lost. We, I mean, we know what to do, but we can't do it. And we, we these guys are our backstop. And so I can't tell you how happy. I mean, like full of joy, happy we are <laughs> that we have people like you in this community who we can say, uh, Dutch Kim, we have a case for you, and you kind of go, I can handle it. And that that to me that that is incredibly wonderful. So. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to save a little bit of time here just to talk a little bit about the the recent changes in your career and and what's happening over at Cedar Sinai because this is a very important uh, part of your story and um, I know that you were at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles for a long time and recently made a move to uh, Cedars where you uh, took over the the role of chief of the division of pediatric surgery. So can you tell us a little bit, can maybe back up a little bit about your children's experience and then uh, yeah. what was behind um, your move to Cedars Sinai? Yeah, I, I came to um, Los Angeles probably in well, 2014 and uh, um, I was recruited by the former surgeon in chief, Dr. Henri Ford, just a, a huge, ginormous personality and leader in our country in pediatric surgery. Um, he has since moved on to uh, Miami to be the dean of the medical school there. Uh, but nevertheless, I had a number of wonderful years uh, at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, wonderful colleagues, and, and they're still there. Uh, I was able to really um, um, produce a lot of great research in our cancer effort there uh, and um, and do a lot of great surgery. Um, I had known the folks at Cedars for quite some time, and uh, uh, they reached out to look at this opportunity of leadership and to help build out this very exciting uh, children's uh, program at Cedars, this new children's hospital, uh, Guerin Children's Hospital. and. Um, it was um, really um, a. Um, it was really kicked off by a, a, a sizable donation by the Garen family, who have been longtime donors of, of Cedar Sinai, and and Cedars decided that they really wanted to provide the highest level, world class care for kid children uh, uh, in Los Angeles, and so they began recruiting some simply outstanding um, people uh, to the hospital, and so. Before I came over to Cedars, um, there were several people who had already come over, people I immensely um, respected, um, such as David Skaggs, who's now the uh, chief of pediatric orthopedics here, and Dr. Richard Kim, who is um, the chief of congenital heart surgery here. Uh, they were over here. They were so excited with the growth 
and the vision and the resources that were being put towards this new children's initiative. And uh, when they said that things were really fantastic, uh, it made it very easy for me to come over and be a part of that. And I was fortunate to be able to recruit a couple of my uh, dear colleagues from Children's Hospital to uh, to help uh, 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 grow our program. So you're so Cedars is going through. This is a new change for Cedars because they're gonna they're really in, investing into this Garin Center. Uh, what will this? What is this Garin Center going to look like? Um, it's it's definitely in evolution. We have. Um, we have a new whole children's ward that's been built out, a brand new floor. It is, uh, you know, I've worked in some great children's hospital. This is this is far exceeds anything I've ever seen before. Uh, it's all built about the children and the families being comfortable in each of those private rooms. Uh, there's a ginormous movie theater game room in there. It's like walking into a spaceship. And we're all so <laughs> impressed. And, and the families just love being there. I remember one of our first patients, he didn't want to go home. He just wanted to stay there. And so uh, that tells you the comfort that they have. Yeah, no, uh, it, yeah. It's, it's amazing that now in, in today's world, uh, we've come a long way. Now these <laughs> kids, you know, it's like going to Disneyland when they go to go get their surgery. And you kind of go, True. well, listen, you know, you're supposed to be sick, okay? You're not supposed to enjoy being in a hospital, <laughs> but they are, you know, and and fabulous. I'm, I'm glad that that experience is not as traumatic, uh, certainly, yeah. uh, as it was when, you know, when I was a kid. I remember getting my tonsils out, uh, Dr. Kim. When I was a kid, I don't know why I did, but they 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 did that to everybody, and I I did remember one thing that was very very special. They had ice cream, that was the <laughs> thing. That was you know, and I I presume that the Garen Center has ice cream. Do you guys have ice cream over there? I'm pretty sure they have a lot of ice cream. <laughs> okay, good. Just just tell them you put that on the on the on the uh, on their menu. All right. Yeah. Um. So they're building. This is going to be a big, a big deal. This is a a, a big development in the Los Angeles area, certainly in pediatrics. Um, your ultimately your capacity, you're going to be able to do heart surgery. What other surgeries could you have, Doctor Skaggs here, who's of course a yeah. famous uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon here in Los Angeles? What other capacity are you going to have? Um, so yeah, Doctor Rick Kim is already doing some of the most complex heart surgery that he used to do at Children's Hospital. Um, uh, one of my specialties uh, uh, is uh, doing complex cancer surgery in children. And so I'd been doing that for years, from my years in Houston to my time in Los Angeles. And so since moving over to um, Cedars, a lot of people have continued to refer those cases to me so that they're coming in. Um, we are continuing to recruit a lot of great specialists, including um, world-renowned oncologists, neonatologists, intensivists. And I think that's really going to round out everything we do. Yeah. Um, which, uh, the, oh. which, 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 sorry to interject, but the, the, when you talk about cancer surgery, can you just give us a couple, uh, an idea of what you're talking about? Yeah. So the most common cancers that we see in children are um, first and foremost, neuroblastoma, which is the uh, cancer that um, um, uh, I study in the research lab. And these are solid tumors that can evolve in the chest and in the abdomen and pelvis, and they can grow quite big. Uh, they can spread uh, or what we call metastasize to so different parts of the body. And so it can be very, very aggressive. And, and these cancers can spread uh, a lot and they can lead to us doing very, very long operations. These are some of the longest and most difficult operations that I've done. Um, other cancers, uh, Wilms tumor is the most common cancer of the kidney. And so we often have to take those out. And then the most common cancer of the liver, which is called hepatoblastoma, we take a number of those out as well. There are a number of other types of cancers, but I would say that the, the most common ones were, were, were those three that I had mentioned. So the overall prognosis on these cancers has changed a lot and since my training, that's for sure. What, oh, yeah. What are, tell us a little bit about prognosis, because that's something, I mean, Wilms tumor is, is pretty much curable. Is that correct? Yeah. Even the aggressive ones, um, you know, and the new protocols and treatments, uh, um, you know, some, some Wilms tumors are far more aggressive than others, but even with that said, you know, there's a re really good prognosis with those. Neuroblastoma used to be pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Um, we're talking well under 50% um, survival, but we have new drugs for that. And um, particularly, 
um, the new immunotherapy protocols. And so um, survival is going up with those, as is um, hepatoblastoma. It's great to see all these numbers come up. And it's been quite remarkable over the last 20, 30 years to see that survival come up. Yeah, no, and you see that with childhood leukemias and things like that. The the, the survival rates are now you know, surpassing ninety percent in many cases. Yes, indeed, it's amazing. Um, well, listen, I I have to say I'm I'm so proud of you, uh, Dr. Kim, for first of all your your commitment to the field, what you're doing, um, and I wish you very the the utmost uh, success at the Garen Center. I think that you are a, a good egg, as we say, <laughs> and you're gonna you're gonna make that uh, center really pop. Um, how can people who are listening to this uh, program today, right now, hearing you, and maybe with the, some of the stuff we're talking about is is relevant to them? How can they find you? Um, we finished um, building out a, a great website with all of us in there. Um, we have, we're have we doing things to try to make access much easier. So we have dedicated phone lines to come see us in the clinic. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and we're reaching out to um, all of our pediatric friends like yourself to so that they have easy access to us so that we can always be available for uh, not only our, our doctor referral friends, but, but also the patients as well. Yeah. So you can, you're can you found uh, just going to, what, what is the name of that website? Uh, just the Cedar sinai Medical Center website. Okay. And you'll, and yeah. that you'll guide your way through that. Just question, you know, put question mark pediatric surgery and you'll find you guys. Okay. Right. Well, listen, um, Dr. Kim, it's been a great pleasure having you today on the Hamilton Review. You're a wonderful guest. I, I wish you the utmost success over there, and my my hunch, if I'm a betting guy, you're going to do it. You're going <laughs> to have great success. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> it's fun to be on the ground floor of such an exciting project, I have to say. I'm sure that's how you feel. Indeed. indeed. Yeah. So, friends, you, we have been uh, having a conversation today with Dr. Eugene Kim, pediatric surgeon. Uh, he's now the chief of the Division of Pediatric Surgery at Cedar sinai uh, great new uh, vistas for them over there in the Garen Center. Uh, find him go, by going to the Cedar sinai uh, Just type it in. You'll find him. And uh, again, Dr. Kim, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much. And for all of you friends, uh, thank you for making us part of your day. Until next time, be well. Bye-bye. You have been listening to The Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcast. Rate and comment and tell a friend.